any time in my life that I'm struggling. I love the fact that I can go back to Jesus Christ. I can go back to prayer and worship. And when I feel him, it's just like the first time I felt him as an 11, 12-year-old kid when I first got the Holy Ghost. And I get it over again, and it's like I remember what everything was about. I remember why I struggle, why I go through life sometimes, and why I still go on, because I've met the Savior, and he lives within me. Jesus lives within my heart, and it makes everything all right. I'm going to read my scriptures quickly so that I can tell you to be seated. So, 2 Samuel 24, 21 through 25. It says, And Arana said, Wherefore is my lord the king come to his servant? And David said, To buy the threshing floor of thee, to build an altar unto the Lord, that the plague may be stayed from the people. And Arana, Arana said unto David, Let my lord the king take and offer up what seemeth good unto him. Behold, here be oxen for burnt sacrifice and threshing instruments, and other instruments of the oxen for wood. All these things did Arana as a king give unto the king. And the king said unto Arana, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar unto the Lord, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord was entreated for the land, and the plague was stayed from Israel. And so, uh, you probably won't understand it now, but I'll just get it out there so I don't forget for TJ's sake. Uh, the sermon I'm titling, uh, what I'm titling my sermon is called Let It Go. And you, got, you, you can be seated. Now, I have to admit, when I first decided to go with this title, I was looking for anything else I could call it possibly, because I was worried... Uh, because of the song that every single child knows called Let It Go from a Disney movie. I was worried I was going to cause some visceral reactions in this place by saying that Let It Go. But um, to get back to the story here, when we open to 2 Samuel 24, David at this point is the king of Israel. We know that. We know if you've read any extensively about David, you know that David's life was tumultuous. It was, it was tough. It was not easy. He, he eventually becomes king, but it wasn't easy. And even when he became king, it wasn't easy then. But the process to get him to this point was not easy, obviously, to the king of Israel. But to be honest, my goal is not to give you a huge background on David's life today. That can be for another time. But what I do want to point out about David and what's often pointed out and what's important to my message today is that David was not a perfect man. In fact, David was far from perfect. It doesn't take much reading into his life to see that he made mistakes. David was a good king, and he had a heart that hungered after God. God called him, you know, the apple of his eye, the man uh, after his own heart. But David certainly failed at times. David committed adultery. He murdered a good soldier in reaction to that adultery. And he also was not a great parent at all, if you look at his kids and what he, how he handled that whole situation with really a lot of his children, but mainly I'm talking about Amnon and Tamar. And in chapter 24 of 2 Samuel, we find yet another mistake that David has made. And I didn't read that part of the mistake. I'm just going to tell you about it to save a little bit of time. But the Bible tells us that David was tempted by Satan. or, or, or uh, David gave into this idea, and he wants to do a census of the people of Israel. And I, I, most people, I feel like, understand the idea of what a census is. It's a counting. He wanted to count the people of Israel, to see how many people he had authority over. He wanted to count the people of Israel to see how many people he was in charge of and that he could lead. And this may not seem like a problem to most, right? We do censuses here in America. But when we look at Exodus 30 and 12, we get to understand the point of why this was such an abhorrent idea before God. So Exodus 30 and 12 says, When thou takest the sum of the children of Israel after their number, then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul unto the Lord when thou numberest them, that there be no plague among them when thou numberest. So in the Old Testament times, when God would tell Moses, in, in the example of Exodus 30, or some other Israelite leader, to do a census, because sometimes God commanded them, he would say, even though I'm commanding you to do, to do this, when you count the people, you have to take ransom money from them, exactly half a shekel is what I looked up, and that is for the atonement of the sin of counting. But what, you're probably thinking, what, what's so wrong with counting the people, right? It's just, it's just a counting method. But in ancient times and in Israelite customs and also other cultures in that day in ancient history, to count something 
meant you owned that something. Right? A shepherd would count his sheep because he owned those sheep. Those were his sheep. And so when you counted something officially, it was saying that you had ownership of the thing you were counting. And so the only time God desired a census to be conducted was upon his command. And even when they did, they would have to give some sort of ransom money to atone for the sin of counting itself. And so, as I told you, a sheep or a shepherd will often count a sheep, showing that he has authority over them. So now we run into the David's, David's sin here. What was the problem exactly? There's actually it's three levels. One, God never commanded the census, right? That's the first problem. God never told David. That was completely David's own idea. Two, there was absolutely no plan. If you go read 2 Samuel 24 in your own time, there's no plan for any sort of ransom money like they would have done in the Old Testament. He was just going to count them and then keep the numbers to himself. And then number three, the most important part, is that in doing the census without this atonement, without this ransom money, David was directly claiming ownership of God's chosen people. David was directly saying that these are my people because I am counting them. And it doesn't matter how long David was king or how good of a king he was, they were God's people. They weren't David's people. God was the one who put him on the throne, and so God could easily take him off. The real authority of God's people belonged to God. And so David's advisors, advisors mainly his friend Joab, uh, you can see that this is such a problem because even Joab, who was far from a perfect guy, he comes to David and he says, are you sure you want to do this? He said, why, I, I hope your kingdom is vast. I hope your numbers and the people that serve you are vast. He's like, but why are you so insistent upon doing the census? You can tell in Joab's words that he's saying this isn't right. What you're doing is not right. But David rashly declares, the Bible literally says, I believe, I, I'll get it wrong word for word, but the king's word superseded the advisor's word. So David used his kingly authority. And he says, you know what? I want the census, so the census is being done. And the Bible says that after nine months and 20 days, David's men come back with the numbers of the census. And it's not until Joab and the advisors arrive back with the numbers of the census that David finally pieces it all together in his head. And he says, I messed up. Right? He finally sees the numbers, he sees the documents, or however they would have conducted the census on that day, and he finally starts to put it together. He said, I've messed up. In fact, in verse 10 of 2 Samuel 24, he says, I have sinned greatly in that I have done. And now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. And I'm not really here to talk about the census. This is just mainly to give a background to the part of the story that I read at the beginning of the sermon. But say what you want about David's life. He certainly made mistakes. Like I said, the adultery, the murder, he made mistakes. But David was not someone, and this is exactly how I want to be, David was never comfortable with living in sin when he knew he was in sin. The moment he found out he was in sin, he said, I have sin in my life, and I need God to get rid of it for me. And that's exactly how I want to be. I don't ever want to become comfortable in my state of sin. I don't want to ever get to the point in my life where I start sinning. I don't even care that I'm doing it against God anymore. But every time I sin, I say, God, I need to come before you one more time and go back to the cross. And so, but as punishment and as a test for David, because we know that sin, although God has paid the price for sins, oftentimes there is punishment for sin still. And so God does something very unique for David in this moment. He says, David, I'm going to give you a decision. He said, for your punishment, I'm going to give you a choice. You're going to have one of three choices. He said, one, there can be a famine that will come through the land of Israel for seven years. And you can imagine David's hearing the first of the three choices. He's like, oh, I mean, that's pretty rough. That's right. That one is not good. And then he hears the second one, and God says, or the enemies of Israel will pursue you and fight you and war against you and be victorious against you for three months. That's option number two. So horrible warfare in which many people will die. And then option number three, I will send a plague for three days. And many people will die in that as well. And so there was no real easy option here that David could choose. All three options were negative and were punishment. But David in verse 14 makes, I think, the right decision. I'd say he made the godly decision as a leader, and I'll explain why. In verse 14, he says, let us fall into the hand of the Lord and not into the hands of men. He was ensuring that he would have the same chance of judgment as his people. I'll explain this. So first of all, he said, let us fall into the hands of the Lord and not of men. In a famine, you would have to rely on your other people and maybe their other neighbors for food, right? And so people might not be stingy and not want to give you food. And the first people that would suffer are the poor. And in war, you'd literally be in the hands of your enemy. 
But he said, with sickness, at least I'm in the hands of Jesus, right? At least I'm in the hands of the Lord. But also, this shows to be an incredibly godly decision by David. Because in a famine, you know who's going to be the least person affected in the famine? The king. Right? The last person that's actually going to get their food taken away from them and starve is the king. So a famine would only affect the people more than him. And then you know who's going to suffer the most in warfare? Not the king. The soldiers. Right? The soldiers are going to die first. And then the families of the soldiers are going to suffer because they no longer have the dads in their family. And so David takes the one where he says, if, I, if there's a plague, at least I have the same chance as the peasant on the street to suffer God's punishment the same way. And so he makes a very godly decision here. And he opts for the three-day plague. And the Bible says that as God is administering the punishment through the angel of the Lord, that 70,000 people of the Israelites were killed due to the plague. And the Bible says that David sees this angel on top of the place where we find ourselves in the, in the focus test that I read, the, the threshing floor of Arana, right on a hill, Mount Moriah. And he, he sees the angel of the Lord administering the punishment of the plague, but he lets the angel of the Lord stay because God commands him to for a second. And this is when David prays and he says, God, I'm the one who committed this sin. I'm the one who committed this atrocity. And then he looks at his people and he says, but these sheep, they've done nothing. These sheep are innocent. He said, bring this punishment to me. Bring this punishment to my house because I'm the one who sinned. And so God tells David, I've heard your prayer. And so what I need you to do then is I need you to go to the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite, which is on Mount Moriah. And I need you to build up an altar in that place and offer a sacrifice unto me. And so what is vital for this message today and the story I just told, I'm sorry it was kind of lengthy, but it's the story of 2 Samuel 24. This is what's important though. When David tells, or when David shows up on Arana's property, Arana the Jebusite, David tells Arana that, hey man, I need your threshing floor, right? God just commanded me, I need to come and get this threshing floor from you and I need to build an altar. But Arana sees the king on his way and you can imagine how the people love the king, right? We see it even in the UK, how much they love the royal family. So Arana sees his king and he says, well, uh, he goes to meet him halfway and he says, you, need, you can have whatever you want. He said, you're the king of Israel. You can have the threshing floor. I even have oxen you can use to sacrifice. I have the instruments you can use to sacrifice. Anything of mine, it's yours because you're my king. But David says something very interesting here in 2 Samuel 24, verse 24. The king said unto Arana, nay, right, no, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. In other words, he was saying, Arana, I appreciate the gesture. I appreciate that you'd serve me so loyally and that you're so uh, loyal to your king and so generous with your possessions. I appreciate it. I really do. But David said, there's more to serving God than just doing whatever he requires of us. It has to cost us something. There is a cost in following Christ. There is a cost in following after God. Because if Arana would have given the threshing floor for free, it wouldn't have been David's sacrifice. It would have been Arana's sacrifice. It, would have been, it wouldn't have been David's worship. It would have been Arana's worship. And so David was saying, I love my God with all my heart. But true love, true following, true serving of a God requires sacrifice and requires a cost. And there's a famous theologian from the 1800s by the name of Adam Clark. He was a Methodist, so, but we won't give him too much flag for that. But... Uh, he said, he who has a religion that costs him nothing has a religion that is worth nothing. Nor will any man esteem the ordinances of God if those ordinances cost him nothing. And so what I've come to preach to you today is that we know that God is the same yesterday, today, forever. He never changes. And so what was true for David back then with Jesus, or he would have called him Yahweh or God, is true for Jesus Christ today in this place. David realized that in serving his God, there was absolutely a cost. There was a cost. There was a sacrifice involved in something that had to be given. And so today when we serve and worship Jesus Christ, it is going to cost us something to follow him. Because just as David said, you can't burn offerings or worship a God in a way that costs you nothing. It's not worship. He said, you, can, you can't do that. You may be thinking now, but what's the cost? Some of you may be even, uh, as they say, clenching your wallets, right? 
saying, oh, man, Blake, what are you talking about, cost? I'm not talking about money. That would be indulgences like the Catholic Church tried to do back in the Dark Ages. I'm not talking about that. But there absolutely is a cost in following Jesus Christ. It's not a certain price. It's not, it's not a possession you have like your house or your car. It's not even good works that you do. Amount of sermons you preach, amount of songs you sing. The cost of becoming a Christian is you. The cost of becoming a Christian is your life. And so I know that may sound weird, but when you follow Christ and you sincerely seek to follow after him, to serve him, the Bible says that you will have to give up your old life. You'll have to give up yourself, or as the Bible talks about it, the old man. In Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, it says that ye put off concerning the former conversation of the old man. You've got to put off the old man. The old man has to die, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So Jesus, maybe uh, the words of Paul aren't enough for you in Ephesians. Uh, they should be. There's still scripture. But Jesus says this in a very slightly different way. In Matthew 16, verses 24 through 25, Jesus says, Then Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, right? If anyone's going to serve me, if anyone's going to love me and follow after me, let him deny himself. And take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life will lose it. And this is it right here. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. We're, we're all about eternal life, and I love eternal life. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to eternity with Jesus Christ. We talked about it in Sunday school a little bit. But can I tell you, the way to eternal life is to lose your life. He said, he who loses his life will find it. And so Jesus is saying, if you desire to follow me, to come after me, to serve me, then you have to lose yourself. He's not asking for a certain price, a certain item in your catalog of possessions. Jesus Christ is saying that the cost of following after him is that you will give up the old man so that he can transform you into a new man that is so much greater than you could ever imagine in your life. And so what we can often do is, if we're not careful, is we'll sell people on this idea that there's no cost to becoming a Christian. There's nothing that has to be, there's nothing that has to die, you know, there's nothing that has to be laid down. And no, there absolutely is. You know, if we look back what the Holy Ghost was given for, right? Uh, the, the one we love to quote is Acts 1, where he says that you will wait in Jerusalem for power, right? So we'd say the Holy Ghost was given to us for power so that we could become witnesses. And that's absolutely true. I'm not negating that. But there's another reason as well. There's a plethora of reasons. And Jesus gives us one in John chapter 3, verse 3, when he's talking to Nicodemus. It says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Jesus is saying, I'm going to send my spirit in that living water so that you can be born again. But I would wager to say that to be born again, something has to die. Something has to be laid down. Something has to go. And what dies exactly? I would say it's the old man. It's the old you. In fact, Romans 6 tells us that baptism is the perfect picture of this. Romans 6 and 4 says, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism, into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. So something you may have heard people say in Christianity, and I don't really hear it as much, or maybe if people say it, they don't really mean it, but it's something we should bring back because it's absolutely the truth. Is that I've heard people say, oh, back in 2015, I gave my life to Christ. You know, Back in 2018, I, I gave my life to Christ. It's kind of the, their way of saying they came to Christ. You know, They, they started to believe. And that's exactly it. I love that term because that's what it is. When you come to Christ, you give your life to him. I am his, right? We talked about it that I, I, am, I can plainly say I love my master. That's what the Bible says. And so when I was an 11 to 12-year-old kid, when I first got the Holy Ghost and actually started listening in church instead of sleeping, the old, in, the old man in me, I was not a man at the time, the old kid in me had to die. Right? I had to lay down some things in my life. I had to realize that, Lord, I want you more than anything else. And so I give you everything. Everything of mine is yours. And through baptism and through belief and faith, Jesus raised me to a new life, and I put on a new man. But be transparent with me today in this place, as I just finished that thought. When everybody, somebody, or whenever somebody, a preacher, or anybody talks about this subject, it can kind of make you wince or cringe a little bit, right? The idea of denying yourself is not easy. The idea can make you a little bit uncomfortable. The idea of losing yourself, denying your flesh, crucifying your flesh, however you want to word it. 
It's not an easy concept or principle, especially in America, because we pride ourselves in our individuality and our freedoms, right? The, the kind of I do what I want mentality. And I love America. I wouldn't live anywhere else. But we have to understand that living for Christ is distinctly different than living just as an American citizen. And so Jesus says that even with our freedoms in America and even with our individuality, we must give up our old lives. We must lose ourselves to follow him and to live in newness of life. And now because I feel that scripture, I, I, hope I, I hope I showed the necessity of that. That was kind of the goal of the first part of this sermon here, to show the necessity of the denying yourself and the losing the old man. I'd like to spend a little bit more time telling you why it's not just a necessary principle, but it's also the best decision in your life that you'll ever make. It is the best decision in your life that you will ever make to lay down your own life and to let God transform you. And I'd also, along the way, I'd like to address some misconceptions that people have. Because sometimes people say, I, I'd like to do that. I'd like to believe that Jesus Christ was enough. I'd like to believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins. But there's always something holding them back, right? And so I want to I address some misconceptions in that area as well. So first, I have heard people say, Blake, I know you say I'm, uh, you know, the Bible says, I, I, Blake, I know you say I'm stuck in sin, right? I'm a servant to sin. I'm a slave to sin, whatever term you want to use. But to me, I'm living a life of freedom. I do what I want. I wake up. I make the decisions I want to do. And my life seems pretty okay, right? My life is fine. And so what I would say to this, and so they'd often say, why would I give up that freedom? Why would I follow Christ just so now I have to follow all the words in that book that you read? And so I would say this. The freedom that sin offers is a facade. It's a joke. It's fake. And it's a trap. Romans 6, 17 through 18 says, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. Other translations use the term slaves to sin. That we were in bondage to sin. Sin is really what it is. It is a bondage. If you were at the CMI service, you've heard me say this more extensively already. It's kind of what I talked about from my little fiery five. But sin wins people over by promising freedom. In fact, you have to look no further than the Garden of Eden, right? It said, when you do this, you're going to be like God. When you eat the apple, you're going to be just like God. He's, he's scared of you when you're going to eat this apple. And so it's promising you all this freedom. It's promising, look at all the stuff you're going to be able to do when you sin. Look at all this freedom you're going to have. And all the while, Adam and Eve didn't even know that they were being put in chains by the, the bondage of sin. And so that's what sin does. It draws people in because it looks good superficially. Right? All sin looks good. I bet the apple on that tree looked very tasty. It looked very delicious. And it probably even tasted good. But it was still sinful. And you know what came upon them? The curse iniquity, sin, the weight of sin. And so I want to remind everyone in this room today that despite what anyone may feel about their lives, that sin is in fact bondage. And sin is a cruel master. It can feed you fake promises. It can even give you pleasure for a season, as the Bible says. But sin will always leave you desolate. It will always leave you broken. It will always leave you alone and wondering why. What got me to this point? I thought everything was all right. If the person, if there was a person that was saying, I'm living my life of sin and everything is going fine, I would say you haven't been living in song, sin long, long enough. Right. You haven't been living in sin deep enough yet. Because I remember when I was living in sin deeply in my life and I hated it. Every night on my pillow, you know, going through those thoughts and, and the sadness, crying yourself to sleep at night because of things that were going on in your life. It's like, I don't want that weight in my life. And so I'd, I also would like to say that sin is not also just a bondage. It certainly is. But on top of this, it is a burden. Sin is a weight. It is literally weight. Psalms 38 and 4, I'd like to take you to this scripture to show my point here. The psalmist writes, for mine iniquities are gone over mine head as a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. And so I, I, brought, I brought something. I'm trying to do my best brother ball impression today. <laughs> I brought my backpack for the school. And, and, you know, this thing's kind of notoriously heavy because I keep all my books in it. But the, the psalmist describes this as a weight, that his sins were a burden, that he felt that he had to carry around. And in fact, he was to the point where he said, God, they're too heavy for me. I can't do this anymore. I can't carry this weight anymore. And so... 
people may get to a point, you know, when humans sin, whether we like it or not, it is adding weight to the life of sin that you have to carry around, whether you think so or not. You may think you're having just fun when you're partying and sleeping around, do whatever you want, sinning in whatever way you want. However, at the end of the day, those choices all have to live with you, and those choices all follow you. And, all, and then at night when you're laying your head down on your pillow, you'll find that you have shame and you have guilt. And the thing about sin is if the weight isn't just the sin itself and the repercussions that come from it, the weight can become the bitterness that sin leaves, with, leaves you with. So not only do you have sin as a weight, but now you have bitterness and depression and brokenness and loneliness. And you're trying to make it through your work day like that. You're trying to make it through your life with all this weight on your back. You're trying to make it through your life with all of the weight of the sins of your life upon you. And of course you can't do anything about that. In fact, the psalmist said they are too heavy for me. And so we have people walking around every day with this weight of not only the sins and their direct repercussions, but the bitterness and the loneliness that comes along with sin. And so that weight of sin, can I tell you, this weight is too heavy. That weight of sin, is, it, it's too heavy. It's too heavy for me. It's too heavy for Pastor Waddell. It's too heavy for even Billy Graham, whoever you want to think of in terms of your, your ultimate man of God, you know, Elijah, the prophet. It's too heavy for him. But thank God for you and me, there was only one person who could carry that weight. There was only one person who could actually carry the weight of sin, and he chose to for you and me. He said, I'll take that weight from you, and I'll carry it. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin. In another place it says, He who knew no sin became sin. God's, this, the, the judgment and the punishment of sin was placed on the Jesus Christ on the cross. So now all we have to do is come to Jesus and say, Lord, I can't carry this weight anymore, and I believe that you already carried it for me. So I'm just going to lay it down and give it to you. Because he carried it for us at a place called Calvary. All I have to do is say, God, I've got sin in my life. I'm imperfect, right? I, I've made mistakes. I, I'm worse than David. I've made many mistakes in my life. And Jesus is waiting there with open arms, ready to take those old garments off you and clothe you with a new garment. He's ready to take that old man off of you and to give you a new man in your life and a new body and a new birth experience where you're transformed. And so people often think, but denying myself means that I'm going to have to allow God to change my life. And he may, I may have to give up something that I don't want to give up. Maybe there's some sinful hobbies that I have in my life that I don't, I don't think they're that bad and I really enjoy doing them. They bring me some measure of satisfaction or... Or, or, or pleasure. But this is such a backwards way of viewing what happens when I'm talking about denying yourself and giving your life to Christ. There are certainly things that Christ will change in you, and there's certainly things that you will lay down as a Christian. That's absolutely true, because God will convict you. And God's Spirit will convict you. But you know what you also lose when you give yourself to Christ? It's the part of deny yourself that people don't understand, or that old man dying. It's not that you're just giving up the things that maybe brought you some pleasure in the past, the parts of sin that seemed nice and pleasurable, but you lose all the bitterness. People forget that all that sin brings worry and fear and anxiety, and all those are things that we don't have to carry anymore because Jesus carried the weights of those on the cross. And so when we're denying ourselves, and I say you got to put off all your man, I'm not saying that you just have to come up and give up your favorite things to do. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you get to come to Jesus and say, God, I have so much fear. I have so much worry in my life. And I can't carry this anymore. But I've given it all to you because you've already carried it for me. He wants you to step. Christ isn't saying deny yourself just because he likes to watch you give up parts of your life or to give up things to give up the old man that's not it he wants you to, to give up the old man so that he can make you into something better than you could ever imagine right like i said he wants you to be born again he wants the bible says be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind you may feel like you're losing something right repentance sometimes is tough right because you're coming and you're be, you're addressing all that sin in your life right nobody wants to look back at the things they've done and realize oh man i'm a, i'm a dirty sinner Right? I've done things that are wrong. Nobody wants to go back to that, those places in their life. And so you may feel like something's being ripped from you or like you're losing something. But in reality, you're gaining everything. Jesus says, he who will lose his life shall find it. In fact, Matthew 16, 26 also says, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You may lose the temporary seasonal pleasures of sin and what it has to offer. 
But in giving over your life to Jesus Christ, you also lose the brokenness and the bitterness that sins bring into your life. And not only this, but you gain, as that scripture just said, eternal life. You gain eternal life and a Holy Spirit that replaces all the brokenness and bitterness now with love, with joy, with peace, and with patience. All that brokenness is gone. All that bitterness is gone. And now you have love. Now you have joy. Now you have peace and patience. And so others, I've heard something, and this is the one that really I've heard so much in my life, is they'll say things like, Blake, I, I want to believe that Jesus carrying my sins on the cross, that's an awesome sentiment. That's an awesome story. That sounds really nice. But you don't understand. I've sinned too much. My sins are too far, right? They, they sort of set it up like this. They'll say, you know, God's sacrifice was great. It covered sins, but my sins are a little higher. You know, I've done a little bit more than what sin, than what God could forgive. There's no way God would forgive someone like me. And so I, I honestly can't blame people for thinking this, and this is why I, I need to open up something here real quick. But I can't blame people for thinking like this because, oh, also, this is my physics textbook from physics, too. Don't ever take this class. If you can avoid it at all costs. But I bring it today to show something because I said I can't blame people for thinking the way I just described because that is simply the byproduct of what people have gone through with human interaction. So I, I've experienced in this in my life, and I, I'd wager to say many of you have experienced this as well, that you come to somebody that you think you could trust. Sometimes it's a Christian, someone you think you can trust as a Christian, and you open up to them, right? And you're kind of serious. I, I've, I've done some bad things. You know, I, I have some things in my life that I'm not proud of, and, I, and I'm coming to you as a friend and hoping that you would help me. You, you keep it on the down low, yes, but that you'd also pray for me and help me, help me to overcome these things. And then those people burn you, right? They go and talk, they go and gossip, they tell somebody else. Or they treat you differently, they judge you because of the mistakes in your life, and they'll, they'll look at all this stuff that you're giving them and they'll say, oh, man, I, I don't even do that. I, I don't even do sins like that. And so the people are left that are open up, they're saying, I'm never doing that again. Why would I trust anyone with that? Why would I ever trust anyone with my sins and my past? Because there's no forgiveness in this world. And sometimes the worst people that do it are Christians. Sometimes the most unforgiving people are the people who have been forgiven the most. And so people are saying there's no way God could forgive somebody because even the people that have sinned don't forgive me. So how is somebody who's perfect and has never sinned going to forgive me? But I want to remind you today that when somebody says this phrase, that they'll say something like this, you don't understand the types of sin or the amount of sin that I've committed. The best answer to that is no, you don't understand Calvary. You don't understand the cross. Because the Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. That means that God, in his omniscience, we know that God knows all and sees all. He knew every, 2,000 years ago this happened. Jesus died on the cross, right, and rose again. That means every sin, every way you were ever going to hurt him, every way you were ever going to betray him in your life, he saw it. And yet on the cross, he still thought of you. On the cross, he still decided, I'm going to die so that this person could have ch a chance at eternal life. And so I want to remind you today, and anyone who may have had those thoughts, or maybe you have friends, maybe this is something you can give them. God is not like us humans. He's not even like us imperfect Christians. When you come to Jesus with your weight of a life full of sin, and you say, Jesus, I have sin in my life. I can't do anything about it. TJ, can you give me Micah 7 and 19? This is verse that's become one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It says, he will turn again, he will have compassion upon us, he will subdue our iniquities, and that will cast all their sins in, into the depths of the sea. He cast them away. Another place in Hebrews 10 says that he will remember their sins no more. And we learned it back to the battlefield, if you guys remember this, that the Bible calls God the God of second chances. Significantly, it doesn't say he's the God of third or fourth or fifth chances, because he's only the God of second chances, because Every time you come to him and he re you receive his forgiveness, it's like you've never done it. So he's the God of second chances. So every time you sin, it's like you've done it for the first time. And so those people 
And what I want to tell them and what I would tell them if they said, Blake, you don't understand. And I said, uh, well, you don't understand Calvary. What's going to happen is they think like people, they're going to come and say, Jesus, I have all this sin in my life and I don't know what to do with it. The burden's too heavy, the weight's too heavy, but they think that Jesus is going to grab their sins and go, oh, that one I can forgive. That one I can handle forgiving. But that one's too much. You can have these back. You just keep carrying your weight. That one's, too, you went too far. You're too far, too far gone for salvation. God doesn't weigh the cost in the moment whether he's going to forgive you or not. Jesus weighed the cost 2,000 years ago on Calvary, and he said, I am going to die for them. He said, I am going to die for them. Forgiveness isn't something that he decides whether or not he's going to give it. The Bible says he's faithful and just to forgive us of our, our sins. It's a promise from heaven that God will forgive your sins. Forgiveness has already been given through the blood of Jesus Christ. And forgiveness is available for every single soul in this room. But most people never even care to look for it or to ask. So can I be transparent with you all one more time? I wouldn't want anyone to sugarcoat the truth for me in my life when it came to real biblical truths. Of course, you know, if you're talking about how I look, maybe be a little nice. No, but I wouldn't want anyone to sugarcoat the truth to me, especially when it comes to the Bible. And so I would say this. Are there times in my life where I think that it'd be easier just to live by the old man, doing it my own way, right? To not deny myself, just to do what I wanted. Absolutely. Those thoughts come into my life all the time. In fact, those are the moments where I sin. I give in to that temptation and I think, my way's better than God's way. I'll try it my way. And that's what sin is. But I can tell you with 100% certainty when I review my life and I actually look back at the events that God has taken me through, I can say with 100% certainty that the worst points in my life, I'm, talk, I'm not talking about, you know, I had a little bit of guilt because I lied to somebody or I cheated on a test at school. I'm talking about the dark points of my life, the lowest of the low points in my life. Those have come in my life when I wasn't surrender. I didn't surrender my life to Christ. When I was letting the old man live, this is why Paul said you have to crucify the old man, to crucify the flesh. And so as you stand with me today all across this room, I'd like to bring you back to David. Why do you think David was always willing to pay the cost? He was always willing to pay the cost to serve his God, right? And anytime he found himself in sin, he said, I'll do whatever it takes. I'll go off for the sacrifices, bring me the ephod in that one circumstance. He, he goes and makes an altar for on Arana's place. He, he goes and weeps and prays and then worships in the temple after his son dies. And so David was always willing to pay that cost. And it's because even with David's mistakes and his severe issues, he realized that he was a man who was in desperate need of a savior. He was a man who realized that he had sin in his life and the only one who could take it away was God. And so David found blessings and peace in Jesus Christ. But you know what? The story is even greater for you because David never got to experience the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. David never got to get that new birth experience in which we're transformed. He found peace in the Lord. He found joy in the Lord. That's absolutely true. But he never got to have the new birth where Christ would live inside of us. And so I would say, whatever is in the way, and this is what I'd say, right? Whatever's in the way, sometimes it's something on your back, that burdenness of brokenness. Sometimes we can become comfortable in that state. Whatever's in the way, you have to let it go, right? Whatever's keeping you from serving Jesus Christ with 100% of your heart, let it go. Life is too short, and our time here is too valuable to hold on to things that aren't eternal. I don't want to live with bitterness. I don't want to live with brokenness, but thank God that Jesus said he can take those away from us. And, and Jesus often expressed himself in, Jesus often expressed himself in, in hyperboles or parables, right? And one hyperbole he uses is in Matthew 5, verse 30. He said, and if, they right, if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that the whole body should be cast into hell. What Jesus was saying in that moment is whatever it is in the way, Whatever's in the way from following me, whatever is in your way from coming after me, you have to let it go. Cut it out is the word he uses. Cut it off. In another term, he talks about the eyes. He says, pluck it out, right? He's saying whatever it takes. He's using hyperbole and exaggeration, of course, but he's saying whatever it takes, you have got to lay it down. Say, my life is not my own. And so I know the cost seems high. 
And so if the singers could join me on stage right now. I know the cost seems high, denying yourself. That's not easy to do. But can I tell you the reward of eternal life and then a life in which Jesus would indwell your life with his spirit, that reward is so much greater than anything that you're going to have to pay or anything that you'd have to give to Jesus. All he wants is you. He's not looking for money. There are, there are times where he certainly will, will require us to give. There are certain times where he'll require us some of our possessions, sure. But Jesus is really looking for you. He's looking for your heart. And so as the singers begin to sing and the song starts to play, I, I, I ask you to come and join me up front right now, anyone that would be willing to come. Because God can change your life today. And all you have to do is give him your life. Right? The, the potter is looking for clay that says, I want to be used. I want to be molded. And so the potter can only use clay that is available. He can only use clay that's ready to be molded. And so I would say today in this moment as we begin to sing, and, any, and we can have people pray for you if you need prayer, give Christ your life. Give Christ everything. And like I said, if there's any weight, if you're in need of joy, you have bitterness, you have brokenness, you have depression, loneliness, I don't care. You don't have to tell me. Uh, you don't even have to inform me of anything that's going on in your life if you don't want to. But give it all to him. Be honest. Right? The psalmist was honest. honest. He said, these are too heavy. And so I, I'm giving them to Jesus because he's already carried them. And Jesus will take those off of you and he will clothe you in a new garment. But you have to lose yourself. And so right now, if you would join me, can we just lift our hands all across this room? Lord, thank you for what you've done on the cross on Calvary for dying for our sins. And we ask Jesus that you would help us to deny ourselves. That we would walk after you, walk after your ways and your, your commandments, Jesus. Crucify our flesh. Jesus.